This video is brought to you by supporters of the Wheelchair Foundation of Danville, California. The Wheelchair Foundation is a great charity which has brought over a million wheelchairs to people in need over the last 15 years. So please check out the link in the description below for more information on the Wheelchair Foundation and how to support them. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of How to Play Warmer 40K 7th Edition. As always, my name is Jay. Now before we start, as mentioned before this began, this week's episode is brought to you by supporters of the Wheelchair Foundation. It is an amazing charity which has brought over a million wheelchairs to those in need. So please go check out the link in the description below. Possibly support them because they're a great charity. As I said, they give wheelchairs to people in need. Can't go wrong with that. And uh, so thank you very much, supporters of the Wheelchair Foundation, for supporting this video as well. And now it's time to start talking about the Assault Phase. We've gone through the Shooting Phase in great detail. Now it's time to start about the Assault Phase. Now the Assault Phase is essentially broken down into two sub-phases. The first one is the Charging Sub-Phase, and the second one is called the Fight Sub-Phase. So first you have to declare your, your Assault target, and then you charge in and see if you can get into base base with them. And then the second part is you actually have to fight them. Today's video is going to be solely about the charge subphase because, as you're going to see, both subphases inc include a lot of detail and a lot of knowledge about the models. So it's better to break this up into two parts. That way, you can go over great de de detail over the uh, the assault phase. So as I mentioned, this week's video is going to be all about the charge subphase, which is also broken down to multiple steps. The first one is deciding which squads you want to assault in that particular turn, also which ones that can actually assault, because not every squad that you want to assault may actually be able to assault this turn. The second part so is declaring your assault. Next, then the squad who's being charged has the opportunity to fire at them, and this is called Overwatch. I'll be going over this in great detail in this video. Next, then you roll to see how far they get to assault on 2d6 typically, and then finally, if they are in, they're in, and if they're not, they're not. And then you either declare another assault, or if you run out of, out of squads that really want to assault this turn, then you go next to the fight subphase, which I will be going over in next week's video. So let's go over these steps in great detail. Now the first part of the charge subphase is figuring out which squads can actually assault this turn. Now there are many reasons why a squad cannot assault this turn. For example, if they're pinned, they cannot assault. If they're falling back, they cannot assault. If they fired weapons that prevent the assault, such as rapid fire weapons, unless they have a rule called relentless, they can't assault the turn that they fired rapid fire weapons. So if any squads, like the Space Marines here, fire their rapid fire bolters, and they don't have relentless, as they typically do not, they cannot assault this turn. Also, what if you fired your weapons this turn and the squad you fired at, they're all dead? Then you can't assault this turn. Now the rules clearly state that you can only assault squads that you fired at if you did fire your weapons in the shooting phase. So if a squad did not fire any weapons in the shooting phase, they're free to assault pretty much any squad that they want in relative proximity to them. But if they fired their weapons, they have to assault that specific squad in which they fired their weapons at. Makes sense. Another reason that you possibly can't assault this turn is that you're pinned or you're already in assault, or you're a monstrous creature that has wings and you changed flight modes this turn. Once again, for these variety of reasons, you can assault in this phase. So now after deciding which squads can potentially assault this turn, you have to next declare your assault targets. And as I mentioned, if you fired your weapons in the shooting phase, it pretty much almost entirely has to be that same squad in the assault phase. So always take that in consideration when firing your weapons in the shooting phase is that you might kill individuals in the squad you want to assault and that might prevent your assault uh, your assault in, in the following turn, right? So there's always trade-offs between firing your weapons in the shooting phase and assaulting in the assault phase. So after you've declared your assault, for example, these orc boys want to assault those space marines. Now they fired their weapons at the space marines in the shooting phase, so they will declare them as their assault target. So the next step after declaring your your assault target is called Overwatch. So basically, the squad that's being assaulted in the assault phase gets one last shooting attack against the squad firing at them, and this can be pretty complicated. Now, typically, 
Uh, they can fire as normal, except they are firing at ballistic skill one, which meaning they're hitting on sixes. But they get to fire their full amount of shots. So for example, if they are in rapid fire range, they get to fire their rapid fire guns, two shots each. Now, the only weapons that can't be fired as Overwatch are typically blast weapons, and there are slightly different rules for Flamer Templates. Flamer Templates, since it is a template, and they're not really in Flamer range at the beginning of the Assault phase, what you typically do is roll a D3, meaning a D6 divided by 2, and that equals the number of hits per Flamer Template. Now, if you have more than one Flamer Template, such as if you have five Flamer Templates, you simply roll 5 D3, and add them all up. You wouldn't roll the dice once and then multiply by five. You roll an individual dice, a D3, for each flamer template. And as I mentioned, so if you roll a one or two on the D3, on the D6, that's a one, a three or four, that's a two, and a five or six, that's a three. And that's the number of hits by that flamer template on the squad that's assaulting in. So flamer templates are unbelievably strong in the, uh, the charge subphase of the assault phase because they hit a lot of things when uh, they wouldn't normally. And as I mentioned, blast templates cannot be fired in the assault phase, unfortunately. That'd be too much fun. So what you typically do is you take up all the number of shots of that squad, so you add up their guns, and now the typical rules still apply. So they still have to be in line of sight, they still have to be in range, and uh, cover saves apply as normal in this particular phase. So you just typically add up all your dice. So in this case, the orcs are assaulting five space marines with bolters. Now bolters are rapid fire, so they can fire up to two shots. And because they're all in rapid fire range, all five guys get to fire their rapid firing bolters. So I'd roll 10 dice, two for each bolter, and count the number of hits. In this case, the number of hits is just simply one. And it's on sixes, because everyone's firing at ballistic skill one typically in the Overwatch phase of the of the Assault phase. So, after I counted the number of hits, the to wound rules are just the same as always. You compare the, the strength of the gun versus the toughness of the individual, figure out what you need, roll to wound as normal, and then you roll armor saves, or cover saves, or invulnerable saves as normal. As I said, cover saves still apply, invulnerable saves still apply, and armor saves can still apply. You just compare the AP of the weapon versus the armor save to see if they get an armor save. If they were in cover, they could potentially get a cover save, unless they are fired at with a weapon that ignores cover, such as a flamer template. And if they have war gear, which gives them an invulnerable save, they get an invulnerable save. Compare these as normal and see if they get a save. And as the same as the shooting phase, you remove individuals from the closest area of the squad. So in this particular case, if the orc boy dies, you'd remove the one that's closest to the squad firing at him. And all this happens before the charge distance is determined. And that is essentially the overwatch phase of the charge subphase of the assault phase. So that's a lot of parts, as I mentioned. Sorry, I don't mean to complicate things. That's how to determine overwatch. So essentially, everyone gets to fire their weapons at ballistic skill 1, except for blast templates. And uh, that's what's called snap firing. And... Uh, you just count the number of hits, roll the wound, and a normal save supply, pretty much. Now, after the overwatch has occurred, now it is time to measure your distance, or determine your distance that you're going to be assaulting. Now, at this point, I always recommend you and your opponent measuring the distance that the squad needs, because that way, it's a very easy way to, to prevent an argument and so you're both on the same page. So if you roll the dice and you both know you're under that amount, you know that you didn't get in. And if you rolled equal to or over that amount, you're in great shape. There are two different situations in the assault phase. And the first one is you're charging through open ground. So meaning there's no terrain that you're charging through. And the second one is you're charging through terrain. And there's different rules depending on the type of squad assaulting in this particular phase. So let's go over the assaulting through open ground. So all you simply do for a normal squad is you roll 2d6, add them together, and that is your number of inches that squad can assault in this particular phase. So you take the closest member of your squad, and you measure to the closest member of your opponent's squad. If your dice is equal to or greater than that amount required to get in, so in this case, they're seven inches apart, as you can see here, right? The closest orc to the closest space marine after overwatch. If I roll a 7 or greater on 2d6 combined, they get into Assault. If I roll 6 or less, 
they fail to get in, and what basically happens is they just stay where they are. They tried to assault, they didn't get in the distance, and they don't move as a result. So if you fail your assault distance, you do not move, and you just stay there, and th the assault phase for that particular squad ends right there. However, if you get your distance, you then have to move the closest individual of your squad to the closest individual of your opponent's squad. Next, you move the individual that is the next closest individual and try to get them, if possible, in base to base with a different member of the squad than the previous individual. And you repeat this process with the next individual. And once the closest ones are moved, then you move everyone else. And the goal is to always engage as many people in your opponent's squad as possible, moving your guys one at a time up to the full distance required. So in this case, if, if they were less than seven inches away and you rolled a seven, you just move them the exact distance, get them base to base, and then you move the next individual and the next individual one at a time until you're done all the individuals of their squad. However, that's for open ground. Now, what happens if there's terrain? Terrain actually slows you down. So what you typically do with terrain, and most infantry do not ignore terrain. Now, if, you're, if your particular models have a rule called ignores cover, or they're a type of model that, that just completely ignores terrain, like bikes or beasts, Though bikes will have to take a dangerous terrain check if they enter terrain in the assault phase. So if your models are affected by terrain, so if they don't have moves to recover, if they're not bikes, if they're just standard infantry like these orc boys, these orc boys do not ignore terrain. So what you typically do is once again you roll 2d6, but then you subtract 2 from your result. So in a normal open ground terrain, the, you can move between 2 and 12 inches, right? The lowest amount on 2d6 is 2, the highest amount is 12 inches. If you're moving through terrain, the lowest you amount is zero because two minus two is zero, and the highest amount you can actually move is 10 inches. 12 minus two is 10. So, before you declare your assault, talk to your opponent. Determine whether or not you will be assaulting through terrain. And by assaulting through terrain, I literally mean, does any individual from the assaulting squad need to move through the terrain to get to the opponent's squad, moving closest to closest and in a straight line if possible? And if so, you will be affected by the train, and you'll have to subtract two from your measurement. So in this particular case, once again, if you had to assault through train in this case, and you were seven inches away, you'd actually have to roll nine or greater on your 2d6 to get into assault. And that's it. So once you've moved all your individuals from one squad, you have the opportunity then to declare your next squad. And once again, you repeat this process. So then the next squad would declare their uh, target for their assault. Overwatch would occur. You'd, move, you'd roll your distance on 2d6, adding them up, and then move. And if you get in the base base with them, you uh, are in assault. Now, if you roll less than the required amount, you just stay where you are. And you repeat this process for all the squads you want to assault in the assault phase. And once you're done with them, you then begin the actual fights of phase of the assault phase. So, so let's go over the charge phase one more time. First thing you do is declare which squads are actually available to assault this turn. Next, you declare their assault target. Now, typically, if you fired your weapons in the shooting phase, it has to be the same squad in the assault phase that you want to assault. Next, you roll, sorry, next, you fire Overwatch. So your opponent fires back at you as you try to charge in with them. And you just fire at Ballistic Skill 1, Flamer Templates, roll D3 each, Blast Templates cannot be fired. Roll to hit as Ballistic Skill 1, roll to wound as normal, cover saves, Armor saves and vulnerable saves apply as normal in the shooting phase. Next, roll your 2d6 to determine your assault range. If you're going through cover, subtract 2. If, you're, if your squad doesn't have move through cover or a rule that would let, let them be ignoring the terrain. If you're equal to or greater than the distance required, you're in assault and you get to keep fighting. Roof roll less, you stay where you are, and you're not assaulting this turn. And you repeat this process for every squad that you want to assault. And that's it. So that concludes this week's video on the charge subphase of the assault phase of Warmer 40k 7th edition. As you can see, it takes several steps and there's a lot of rules applying. But that's okay, because next next video we're going to be getting to the assault phase and that's where a lot of the fun happens in Warmer 40k 7th edition. It's my favorite phase of the game by far. So thank you as always for watching. Most importantly, I should bring up once again that this week's video is brought to you by supporters of the Wheelchair Foundation. It's an amazing foundation. It's brought over a million 
wheelchairs to those in need over the last 15 years. So go ahead and check them out in the link in the description below. I think they're a great charity and definitely worthy of your support. Thank you so much for watching this episode. Leave comments in the comment section down below if you want to add anything else to what, what I possibly missed. And uh, thank you as always for watching. Until next time, this is Jay saying, happy painting.